Hello and shalom to you all. It is wonderful to have this opportunity to explore the biblical creation story, particularly from Genesis chapters 1 to 3. This is such a, an exciting subject matter, an immense subject matter. But before I get into it, I uh, want to give a, a heads up that if I seem to be somewhat distracted, it's because I have something of a drum set going on in my head as uh, my second day of symptoms from being po uh, tested positive for COVID. But uh, I can't postpone this uh, any longer. I appreciate all the patience that has already been shown to me. So let's get right into this subject matter that is particularly focusing on an ancient Near Eastern perspective of the cr biblical creation story with an emphasis on sound and wholesome instruction, which is indeed uh, a uh, essential importance of the story itself and in, in its purpose. Before I get into, it's going to be important to start with a, a, a brief exploration of the modern importance of uh, this story. Uh, where are we today in regards to our, our society in relationship, our attitudes towards uh, this story? story of scriptures, these early foundational chapters, whether from a scientific perspective, from a faith perspective. And then I'm going to essentially uh, explain why I uh, believe that we are approaching, generally speaking, these chapters with a, uh, a flawed hermeneutic. We are applying a, a, a method of interpretation that is not local to the story itself, and that's where we uh, find ourselves in a lot of problems. And therefore, I will be exploring what would be, from my perspective, a proper hermeneutic uh, that is local to this story from the time period in which we believe it to have been handed down to us. And therefore, gleaning in a, an understanding of the purpose of creation stories in general, as we learn uh, in comparison with other creation stories, and then looking specifically at our creation story in contrast to the other creation stories of the ancient Near East, how are they so wildly different? And then look at how are they, what are some parallel themes that we can observe that help us to appreciate our own story uh, in a in hopefully more meaningful manner and therefore begin with an application, begin to find an application of these chapters in a meaningful and appropriate way. That's how I see the next hour and a half. I, uh, am, a, I am excited to go through this material. And now just as a, as a, uh, a side note, I just this month finished uh, a year-long uh, exploration of these three chapters on my weekly live stream that I have with my, uh, my uh, Patreon uh, supporters. Present. So let's get into it. So beginning with a, uh, an, uh, an assessment of the modern importance of this foundational story of the Bible. The scriptures are foundational for Western civilization and wow. therefore where we get our Judeo-Christian values in our Western civilization. And if this creation story is foundational for the Bible, it's therefore also foundational for the civilization. Now, we talk about this civilization now as a global phenomenon, thanks to uh, the British Empire, who had its day, and now uh, the uh, American uh, superpower status and ability, that, well, we wonder if indeed, what will be this f the future of these things? And, the, and that question is also quite um, embedded in how we understand these foundational uh, wherever you find a, a culture that is emerging, even from an indigenous people, with an urban society that is planned, pre-planned, organized, in a grid of sorts at least, w uh, with the convenience of modern infrastructure that promote not just convenience but health and mobility, uh, wherever we have the development of a free and open market that promotes a, a prosperity for the people of that society more so than any other period of recorded history. 
wherever we have uh, institutions that promote education of the sciences and the modern scientific method that amongst many uh, many uh, contributing uh, manners also contribute to the ability to produce large measures of food that is able to now feed more people with more food than any other period in, in human history, observable human history, wherever you have a society that values freedom, liberty of the individual as a, as a framework for the society at large, and therefore ex- uh, seeking out, searching for, and, and bringing an end to slavery in various forms, these are the gifts of modern Western civilization, and many more. But these fundamental elements of wherever we have the, the culture of respect of the individual, of having intrinsic value, we have to ask, where did these values come from? And indeed, they come from the Bible, from the Judeo-Christian influence uh, that shaped and directed this civilization. And so therefore, when we talk about this civilization, yes, it has its origins in, in, in Greece and in Europe, etc. But thanks to the British, thanks to the Americans, it has split into, spread into a global phenomena that uh, so many people benefit from. And those... Uh, those principles, those those ideas, those values, those advancements have at their beginnings the Enlightenment itself. The whole history, I'm sure you've had opportunity to learn of it. If not, there's lots of great resources. All right? The pursuit of truth and liberty. All right? That's the, essentially the Enlightenment uh, movement that would spread throughout Europe. As opposed to the ideals of submission. And in this, well, I am making reference to Islam as a, as a, um, a fundamentalist uh, religion. The meaning of Islam is submission. And this is part of why there has been great conflict, between, civilizational conflict, or uh, the, the uh, uh, conflict that is indeed global conflict, not just between Western civilization and Islam, but also the notion of there being no truth. Now, that already is an internal conflict, not just external. It is also external, but it's internal. And that conflict uh, finds its, uh, its, its place, its, its uh, inspiration from postmodern, postmodern philosophy, which is also associated with communism. There's wonderful lectures that uh, professors um, have uh, done that can illustrate uh, historically in a very helpful manner. And so there is a, uh, a trend of a global conflict with, as well as within Western civilization with other philosophies, other uh, sets of values. And the question is, indeed, what should we value more? Uh, and it is a, a perhaps more so an American idea that, well, we should be pragmatic about it. What yields itself to having a better life for as many people as possible? Uh, how, what goes well? That's what sh- we should pursue. And there is another element of this uh, global uh, conflict, uh, civilizational conflict, that's also internal now. And that's what I would call a spectrum of uh, integrated spiritualism in reference to Hinduism and, and Buddhism in their varieties, uh, also known as the New Age movement, and their subgroups. All right, this, uh, the, these, of course, is a very foreign culture to, to the West, but has in, been brought into and indeed integrated within the West, sometimes for, for good, sometimes not for good. And it is not always clear to people uh, when it is, and is not uh, truthful or beneficial. Well, this is another element that I'm not going to be going into, but these are, if I was to observe globally, uh, these are three big conflicts that we can observe on the glo- global scale that is also true within. Now, why I go into all of this, the, uh, into this is because uh, of the, the schism that we find within Western civilization in particular, between the science versus faith communities. 
particularly also of scholarship, but not only, it trickles down to all the rest of us, just common, normal, everyday people who want a path to walk forward on. Right? The, there seems to be this irreconcilable schism between science and faith. Now, the, the, the tragedy of that is, well, indeed, that the, the initial inspiration for modern science and development of the modern scientific method, thanks to the Enlightenment, etc., was inspired by faith, particularly Christian faith, but not only, the, the love of God. This is what inspired, drove early scientists uh, to, to pursue a knowledge of the, the material world, the natural world, so to know God, and indeed, therefore, to honor and glorify Him. And so, uh, at, in the beginnings, it was a unified pursuit. However, as atheism will eventually become very popular, thanks in, to, in no small part to the, uh, the scientific history itself, but the atheist and religious subjectivity in the scientific process itself during the, the past hundreds of years, uh, from, the, from the, the beginnings of the Enlightenment till, till now, a, uh, no less than in the past, that scientists who have themselves developed a method to observe, to analyze, so to know what is true, what is real, themselves had and have a problem of following the method, of being scientific. And, uh, and being objective in their, uh, in their uh, assessment, there is uh, a problem both for the atheist scholar as well for the religious scholar, both for the atheist scientist as well as for the, the faith-driven scientist. Uh, the, there has been a problem in that regard. And so, therefore, with this, lock, this lack of integrity, we have a loss of trust from both communities towards one another. So also within the, uh, the, with the scientific community uh, has been this philosophic competition where there I would just make, mention three, um, three elements. And for this, I want to, to, uh, to make mention to, to Tim Haig, who I know is also uh, uh, um, participating, lecturing in, in this, this conference. Uh, I had the privilege of taking his, his course, an introduction to philo uh, philosophy. It's very helpful. Really recommend anybody, everybody to take it. It's, it's uh, very useful. And so we, w within the, the development the scientific development we, uh, that is founded on the philosophic breakdown of rationale and logic, the, in observing the, the belief systems of peoples throughout history, and this is where I start to come closer into the, the creation narrative, but I would say uh, narratives now, because there are many creation narratives from many peoples, you might say indigenous peoples, throughout the world, they all have a story. And what is so often uh, uh, present within their stories is the problem of infinite regress, meaning we all want to know where have we come from, what are the beginnings. And so we go back in our memory, we go back in our assessment, we go back in our, our observations. And the question is, is how far back can we go? Is it infinite? We, is it continuously going back? Meaning there was no real beginning of, of, uh, of all that is, all matter, all energy, everything that is, does it have a beginning point? Well, so often when we are observing people's beliefs and deities and such, particularly in the old world, but still today, they are themselves the elements themselves. And so what was the beginning of those elements of the, that are deified? So because of the observation, the logical understanding that we need to uh, uh, be logical in our pursuit of truth, pursuit of knowledge, so that we have a firm foundation. To do so, we have to recognize that this infinite regress, uh, perpetually moving back, 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 is just simply illogical. It doesn't work. And therefore, it would be the development, uh, the, the counter to this, uh, uh, that every, every motion has to have a beginning point. Right? The, every movement of energy and matter and space and time has to have a beginning point. So what was that beginning point? 
That is, that is the, the philosophic, logical question that is so necessary. You have to have somebody to begin the motion. You have to have something to initiate everything that will unfold. And, however, if you find that person, that power, that entity, well, then where did he or she come from? Where did that matter, that, uh, uh, that element come from? And so, therefore, uh, that infinite regress must come to an end. And, therefore, the idea of the immovable mover. There must be a power. There must be an entity, a person. There must be, therefore, a God who initiated everything, who, in, who began the act of bringing forth all matter, all energy, all that is. When we talk about the immovable mover, uh, the, the philosopher them himself was not necessarily uh, thinking about the Bible, wasn't uh, Jewish or Christian, but the, the logic is helpful and important and is the foundation, it's the philosophic uh, uh, principle behind modern creationism within the scientific community of faith and therefore the people of faith. Creationism indicating that there is an intelligent design. When we observe life, there is a design, and it's intelligent, and there must therefore have had an intelligent being to create it and to initiate it, to move forward all that will be. And within that idea is therefore founded from the scriptures, from the Bible, the intrinsic value and meaning to the whole story, to everything. Everything has meaning. It's, it's, it has, it's purposeful. It's not random. That's the competition with this ideology, and that is random beginnings. All right? uh, the, the more atheist scientific community is going to be heralding the, the Big Bang theories and neo-Darwinism as it is today for the evolutionary theory. That is random, essentially, not directed by an intelligent being, a god of some sort. No, it's random. So therefore, if it is random, it's without intrinsic meaning, and therefore uh, value. If it's without value, it's without meaning. If it's random. So these are the, the three competing, competing ideas that I can summarize. Infinite regress, or immovable mover, leading to our, I, uh, our confidence in the biblical uh, narrative of creation. In the beginning, God created. He is the source, the beginning, the in, uh, intelligence of it all. And therefore, uh, he had a purpose. There is a reason. Therefore, there's meaning and there is value. Or the, other, uh, the alternative option is random beginning. Now, this infinite regress is also found within the modern Western scientific community. And that's part of what I mean, that there's, there, there's uh, not always really strictly following scientific method that depends also on philosophic reason and logic. It's, it's necessary. Uh, it's, well, it's uh, apparently not necessary for, uh, for these scientists and therefore these, uh, the people who will follow and believe. So, therefore... All, why all that is important is it illustrates the central importance of the Genesis record. Genesis, found the first book of all of Scripture, Bereshit, particularly the first 11 chapters are the chapters that come under particular criticism. That is just from the modern scientific atheist community is simply illogical. It is, it is mythology. It's not... It's, it's uh, uh, not dependable. And therefore, it's at the core of the ideological conflict within Western civilization. That's why this is important for us, who we are in the faith community. Uh, what characterizes us, what characterizes our faith? Are we, are we most to be pitied? We're illogical beings. We are easily fooled. Or... Do we stand on our own two feet, philosophically and scientifically? It is uh, the, uh, the, the, the quality of uh, uh, believing Jewish and Christian scholars and scientists is no less 
than the quality of the atheist scientists. Although, uh, uh, where we are today is essentially uh, um, a loss in this 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 uh, competition of of values, so where for the atheist scientist determining truth for the civilization and its institutions meaning they're the ones now who have succeeded uh they they have uh, been victorious well for them creation in seven days is utterly laughable it's it is ridiculous and therefore it's di- uh, they are discredited by the faith scientist because they they are unable to accept the biblical record philosophically for the faith scientist however who no longer determines uh, uh, truth for the mainstream remember in the past they did right the early scientists of europe were uh, uh, believers they were devout christians they loved god and they f- therefore determined what is true for the the society and and its institutions but that's no longer the case now it's the atheist society the atheist scientist is the one who determines what is true and that's part of why this is so important for us. We're no longer relevant. But we must become relevant once again. So for the faith scientist, the problem of the philosophic rational problem of infinite regress and random beginnings, this, well, coupled with the, the impossible demands of, of uh, evolutionary theory from their perspective of the scientific data, it is uh, indeed uh, utterly foolish. Therefore, they are discredited by the atheist scientist and atheist scientist community. Both are unable to have a dialogue anymore. They're unable to have a scientific dialogue anymore. It's a tremendous loss. At the core is the biblical creation story. They're both looking at our biblical creation story and assessing it and discrediting it or building a foundation on it and therefore rejecting one another. So we must have a a, a good and proper understanding of it, therefore, because it is fundamental to the conflict that has become a civilizational conflict, particularly internally, in that liberal scholarship who, I would say, manipulate the scientific process in dissecting the Bible. This began hundreds of years ago, not functioning on a, a, a proper scientific method in their, their approach to the Bible. All right? This was before uh, history was a proper uh, field of science. And it's still debated if it's even possible to be, uh, um, to be such. But in, indeed, it, there is much to be gleaned. And so in their, in their dissecting of the Bible, tearing it apart, uh, not just chapter by chapter, but paragraph by paragraph, and then sentence by sentence, within the sentences, just tearing it apart. But, but doing so as scientists, not following the scientific method. Right? It was therefore an unscientific proving the Bible to be unreliable. You prove it to be unreliable, and therefore the masses began to follow, they began to, to lose confidence in the, the religious institution, in the Bible itself. But it was an unscientific proving of the Bible. Right? You understand that what I'm trying to say? The authority that was given or claimed is because we are scientists, but we are proving in an unscientific manner. And that is why this is such a problem. Uh, it's uns- it's it's what weakens the civilization. The Christian response to this, and often and now also uh, religious Jew religious Jews get excited about Christian work. I don't know if they will give credit, but they do. Uh, in that, uh, in response, Christian scientists uh, will seek for search for how can we take our founding story of creation and from it observe a scientific observation of how did indeed the world come into existence in seven days. And there's many variations in that, of course. 
but this will be the uh, the activity of the creationist uh, uh, movement uh, that is uh, that is uh, that has a lot of amazing uh, um, scholars and scientists uh, working to to find show prove illustrate and there's a lot of great work that has uh, been done and written a lot of extensive commentaries how to read our founding story particularly the first three chapters, but essentially the first 11 chapters of Genesis as scientific, as therefore true. And uh, unfortunately, uh, what would make me probably very unpopular is that I will claim that both have a serious error. Neither community, not the atheist scientists and not the faith scientists, are implementing a good scientific method. Just their approach to the biblical story is with a wrong hermeneutic principle. What can I say? If we observe it objectively, we're not implementing the, the, the right principles. We want to outline what would be a productive hermeneutic guideline. And that is by asking specific questions that are productive, that are useful, such as, who is the author? Who wrote the document that I'm reading? When did he live and when did he write it? Wh when was it written? Where was it written? What region in the world are we dealing with? Are we dealing with, with India? Are we dealing with Persia? Are we dealing with... with uh, where are we dealing with? And therefore also, why was it written? Where was it written? And why did he do so? Why did the effort be put uh, got put into producing this uh, document that I'm reading? Why was it written? In what format also? Because as I continue to discover more and more ancient documents and I start to read more and more, I start to observe that they're not all the same. There are quite significant differences between them. And I start to observe uh, the, uh, the various genres that I will formulate in order to make sense out of what I am observing. So, therefore, what genre am I reading? Is this about law? Is it about wisdom? Is it, about, is it history? Is it... What is it? And, therefore, to whom was it written? Who wrote it? To whom did he write it? Who was the audience? And why... What is he trying to communicate? What is his purpose? If I don't know who the, 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 the audience was, then I won't know also what the purpose was for. So all of these questions, they come together, and there's more, of course, but all these questions come together to give a, 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 a good guideline. And I'm not being, uh, saying that um, scholars don't do this. Of course scholars have, uh, uh, do this, and they produce wonderful commentaries that are uh, uh, based on these questions and that are extremely helpful for us. But when we are strict to these questions, then we find that, uh, uh, that these, they guide our method of interpretation. And therefore, we observe that our creation story of the Bible Genesis 1 to 3 onwards, but particularly the first three chapters, well, is placed within a story. The placement of the story is within historical geography. There is, speci there is specific geography, and that geography is of what has now come to be known as the Fertile Crescent. Why? Because starting in Mesopotamia, in the Persian Gulf, moving up northward, and then eventually through Aram or Syria, coming down into ancient Canaan or modern Israel, and then continuing uh, down to North Africa uh, in Egypt. There is a pathway of green in, the, in vast deserts. And therefore, it's fertile, and it looks like a crescent, and there is where we find the birthings of civilization that we can observe, because there are simultaneously, almost similar time periods, was the, de the uh, development of writing and recording, therefore, the human experience, the human story. And civilizations emerge, kingdoms will develop.
and kingdoms have their armies that will try to expand their power and they will and coming from Egypt moving through Canaan over to Mesopotamia conquering for uh, and, and vice versa the ba the ancient Babylonians the ancient Assyrians coming from Mesopotamia modern day Iraq they're going to be coming north south through Canaan to Egypt and they are going to be in direct contact with one another direct competition civilizationally and competition for resources competition for power competition for land resources so they the we find that that is our historical geography and we can't just observe one without the other yes completely different cultures and developments but they are so uh, they they influence one another so significantly that we observe how they influence one another in their writings and in their artistic designs. And then specific people, we find that, uh, uh, although that is the region, the specific people of the Hebrews, the descendants of Abraham, the first to cross over from Mesopotamia over the, the great river Euphrates into Canaan. Thus, he is one who crosses over. He is a Hebrew the meaning of Hebrews to cross over, and his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, becoming Israel, the prophets and scribes of Israel, then writing all of this great record that we have, uh, the biblical revelation, inspired by the Spirit of God. This is our people that we're talking about. We find the, the uh, uh, first story told before it was written. That's an important uh, principle that guides our interpretation of it. It was first a story that was told. Why do you tell a story? Well, what's the purpose? When you start to write that story down, why? What is the purpose of writing it down? It's in our stories that we communicate who we are. Where have we come from? How should we conduct ourselves? And if we conduct ourselves well, where will we be going? If we don't conduct ourselves well, where will we be going? What will be our fate, our future of our civilization? And so it was first a story and then eventually written down. And there was a format in which it was written down that we can observe, particularly in Genesis, a format that is that we find observable from other cultures in the ancient Near East, in the Fertile Crescent. And that is a, a phrase that is found on clay tablets of though these are the Toledot, the generations, the, the descendants, the, the ancestry. This is the story. And when we find the, the, that phrase outside the Bible and also inside the Bible, we come to understand that it indicates that the story was owned by someone, a family. A family possesses the memory of the story and passes that memory down from generation to next. And that the way in which they communicate the memory is significant for communicating identity. Who are you is part of what I, I am communicating to you and telling you the story. But it's a family story. It's who we are going back generations. And so if you know where you have come from, you know how to conduct your life. And therefore, how to, uh, w uh, what will be your destiny, your future? Well, when we, uh, when we observe that within our creation story, we find something of a problem in that we observe that in these seven days of creation, it's on the, on the sixth day, at the very end, the, the final act of creation is to create humanity, eventually named Adam and Eve and their sons and their descendants. Well, if they are created by the Creator, by God, at the end of this chapter of six days of creation, how do they know about those past six days? Who is telling them the story? Where do they get the knowledge, the record from? Well, is it is it God? That is one suggestion. God told them directly in the garden. He explained to them, "This is this is what happened. This is what I did. This is how I created." Or another suggestion is what we can maybe observe directly from the story itself, and that is at the summary statement recorded for us in chapter 2, verse 4. That these are the generations. These are the Toledot. Ele Toledot HaShamayim These are the 
genial, the, the generations of the heavens and the earth. Behibaram, beyom asot Adonai Elohim, eretz v'shamayim. On the day on which the Lord God created them, made the earth and the heavens. Well, so much, this is such an important verse in so many ways, in that, well, it also may offer to us a, an understanding in this, in this question. Where does the knowledge come from? Well, what is peculiar in this verse, there's quite a few peculiar things, but one of the, the, the first peculiar thing is that these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. We expect to find that of Adam and of Eve, of, of Noah, of, of the various different individuals who will be the ancestors of this family moving through the generations, right? You should have a name of an individual. Instead, here we have, this is the story of the heavens and the earth. They own the story. They are the ones who have recorded it. They're the ones who pass it on. They're the ones who transmit it. It belongs to them. The, uh, the heavens and the earth, on the day in which the Lord God created them, which he made the earth and the heavens. So they are telling about how God created them. And that is uh, essentially what we uh, love about this story, is that it is through the observation of the heavens and the earth, through the observation of creation, that we come to know the Creator. Who is he? What is he like? His character. Now, in in uh, w- along those lines, we have a, a famous uh, statement that that uh, is made by Shaul by Paul, and when he writes to the Romans in chapter one, we we there's a this, this great statement that all of the invisible qualities of God have been clearly seen. His powers. Everything about God, you, there is so much we can know simply by observing what has He done, the act of God, the creation, the the Creator make, makes manifest His character in what He does. So, therefore, the heavens tell your glory. You observe the beauty, the vastness, the the majesty. The dangers, the the mysteries, the the, the questions that uh, we 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 that are calling out to us when we observe the natural world, they tell the story of how God created them. And that's why when we observe, therefore, chapter one of Genesis, it is remarkably simple, particularly in contrast to the other creation stories of the ancient Near East. When you open the, the the collection, the anthologies, the collections of these books, of these these stories, they're exciting, but they're very different. And they're nowhere near as simple, as precise, as direct as the biblical record. It is logical, even. It, it there are some real questions, some ir- some purposeful irregularities that I would like to point out a little bit later, that are intended, therefore, to draw us into their mystery, draw us into the story, to investigate, to explore, to understand. But by and large, it's rational. It makes sense. It's simple and it's profound. And there's a logical presentation and no explanation, essentially. There are statements without explanation. So how do we understand them is, is, is the question. But the simplicity results with there not being need for much explanation. You can observe it just as it is, so it is. Now, that's a maybe oversimplified statement. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have taken a year to try to explore. Maybe I read into it. That's also possible. But uh, by and large, anybody can open it and just be inspired by its simplicity and its beauty. Because that's what happens when you observe the natural world. You simply observe and you start to see and understand. Well, in identifying the type, the genre of this story as a creation story, well, we, we then need to ask, how do we identify this as a creation story? Obviously, it's about 
creation, that's the focus. And when we do that, within the region of the ancient Fertile Crescent, from Mesopotamia to Egypt, we then observe other creation stories. Like I said, everybody had creation stories. And, and therefore, we observe what kind of information is in those stories. We observe what kind of information is in our story. We observe uh, 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 the, the other stories from the other regions, and they instruct us. They give us a, a big picture of how to deal with this genre of storytelling, of scripture. And that brings us to a critical question. Part of why I took so much time in the introduction to talk about the, the relevance that this, this has in uh, our modern society is that modern, one of the things that modern uh, liberal scholars will like to claim in observing our biblical story is that the, the Hebrew authors of Israel, of the scriptures, they essentially copied from the older stories from Mesopotamia and from Egypt but particularly from Mesopotamia, they, they copied from them. They're older, and uh, there are some similarities, and therefore we obviously took from them because we came later. But that's what we're dealing with, even here in Israel. Yes, there's more conservative scholarship here in Israel as well, maybe more in Jerusalem, but still, by and large, it's more liberal. It is uh, uh, not, it's not uh, seeking to engage with Scripture from a, a faith perspective, and therefore holding a high view, but not the highest view. So, therefore, the assumptions that we borrowed from other peoples. But that by itself is a problem. It's illogical. It is not following the scientific method. And the one example of how we can observe that to be the case is how we observe the Egyptian development of writing, so very different and a little bit later than how the, uh, the, the method of writing in Mesopotamia was developed. It completely different. Right? Cuneiform is very different than uh, communicating in pictures, the way in which the, uh, the hieroglyphs of Egypt. Completely different. The Egyptians a little bit later than the Mesopotamians. Well, if the Egyptians borrowed, copied from them, you know, there was a lot of contact. Why didn't they use the same? Okay, why didn't they not uh, use their writings? Why are their stories different? Why is the content of their stories different? In that, when we observe the peoples and we observe the different writings that belong to the different peoples in their regions, we find the important common ground of the function of creation stories that are relating to their geography, what's relevant for them, where they live. Different phenomena is going on in Mesopotamia between the two rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates as opposed to what's going on in North Africa along the Nile River. Excuse me. Different phenomena and therefore different needs, different stories, similarities, some common grounds. Because we're all human and we have similar uh, uh, needs and, and uh, uh, we approach our challenges in similar ways, there is common ground. And uh, what's common is common thematically. But particularly true for the biblical creation story is it's completely different content. What you observe in, the, in Genesis is so different from what you observe in the Babylonian story or the Egyptian story, in the Canaanite story. So the, 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 the liberal scholarship is, once again, not as scientific as they strive and claim to be. Therefore, what we should do when we are engaging uh, these ancient documents is compare. That's basically what we can do, is we can compare. And when we compare them, we find... What is common? What's similar in terms of, of, of language and themes and concepts? We can start to, to construct for ourselves a dictionary, so to speak, of how did they use the language that I'm reading and I assume I understand. We all we, we use words confident that the meaning we intend to be understood 
in the words that we choose will be received and understood by whomever we're communicating with. Obviously, that's communication. But what if I'm using words, what if I, the way in which I use words, the meaning I associate with my words is different from, how, from the meaning you associate with the words you're hearing me say. Now, that is generally not happening, but it does happen even today, even within one language, let alone cross languages, cross cultures cross geographies, even more so cross time periods. We are observing a very ancient document from a foreign land, from a foreign people, a foreign culture, and we assume that the words we're reading mean the same to us as it meant to them. What we need to do in this scientific method is what did it mean to them? How can I determine that? Is it possible to determine that? Well, the postmodernists will say, no, you can't determine that. It's impossible. And they have a good point. But when we observe commonalities, when we observe uh, similar use of, of ideas, themes, and concepts in the same genres of stories, then we can start to piece those together and bring for ourselves something of a dictionary that we can use to approach our story when it is applicable, when it's relevant. We can start to... Uh, uh, use this dictionary to have more confidence, maybe not 100%, but more confidence that when we're reading our biblical story, we understand it better. We, ha we, uh, we know perhaps more what did it mean to them, how would they have understood it, than, uh, and therefore let that instruct us. And th therefore when we seek to apply the, the, the information, the content, the wisdom, hopefully, to our lives, then it will be much more meaningful. And then, while we're comparing, we will need to contrast because it's so different also. By and large, the stories are so different, we have to contrast. We're, we're forced to because that's what we observe when we're comparing. And what we're contrasting f from the biblical creation story from the other peoples is theological, it's ontological, meaning uh, how to understand the nature of being that they understood for themselves. Whether in Mesopotamia, did they understand the nature of being differently from Egypt? Did they understand it differently from Canaan? Did they understand it differently from what they will encounter when they first hear the biblical story? Right, we, will, uh, we will contrast the, the understanding of how to view the world, how to view life, how to view themselves, and th ultimately how to view God. The theological contrast is significant it is of great importance but it means therefore that there is a dialogue there there are the, these ancient peoples are talking to one another in a certain in, to a certain degree they they and that they are crossing over and experiencing each other for trade for war for politics religiously they are impacting one another there is a there's a dialogue about the gods there's a dialogue about the world there's a dialogue about how should we conduct ourselves in the world and that is ultimately the relevance of our biblical story the word of god is to reveal about god to whoever is encountering it either by an audible story or reading in the pages of the scripture the, the it's revelation it's to be instructive and it's even more impactful when done through something of a dialogue right there the, uh, there there's comparison there is contrast there is un seeking for mutual understanding to assess well who is more true Who's more correct? Who, who has it better? Well, ultimately, the stories are also about survival and therefore about uh, what do we need to do in order for it to go well for us. And that's the relevance of the biblical story. It's revealing the God whom they didn't know. It reveals the invisible living God, creator whom the nations knew not. It reveals it to them. and reveals how he created as opposed to how they believed things created. So, 
in conclusion, what is the purpose of the creation story? In comparison and in contrast with the other creation stories, what can we we uh, um, observe? What can we assess? Essentially, fundamentally, it's an origin story. Simply put, a creation story is an origin story. It seeks to answer fundamental questions that we have of where do we live? Now, when you're born within a geography, it takes some time for you to observe, know, and integrate that geography into your sense of self and being and how to function there. Where do we live is what is instructed in this creation story. And how did we get here? Were we always here? Or did we migrate here from somewhere else? How did we get here? And in that we're here now, what are the elements of our geography? Where we live? What, what, What characterizes it? Is it just desert? Or are there mountains? Is there rivers? Is there sea? Are there, what is here? What is the characteristics, the elements of our geography? And, the, and are those elements dangerous for us? Right? What are the dangers in this region? But those dangers are also potential adventures, potential areas of advancement. The, the ability to progress the society, the civilization, if you can identify them as dangers and understand the dangers, then you can start to engage in the adventure of the danger and it might go really well, not just for you, but for everybody. So, an origin story. Who are we? Where do we live? How did we get, we get here? And intrinsic to all of that is who is our God? In that, well, those elements will be deified. The sun will be deified. The moon will be deified. The stars will be deified. The sea will be deified. The earth will be deified. They deify everything and every, all these elements. Well, who is our God? What's his name? What is her name? And what are the generations of gods that will be born one from the other? And what is the interaction of these gods being born? Essentially, what is it's, it is essentially observing the natural world and regressing back. What, how far back can we observe a natural, rational, a logical story of the beginnings? What came first and then what came next? Did the earth come before the sea or did the sea come before the earth? Uh, uh, was there air and humidity before there was the sky itself? Was there light before there was sun? Right, these will be deities who give birth to one another as the, they are creating the world in which we live. That is the region in which we find ourselves and have to understand. And they're all named. So who is our God and what is his name? Who is the goddess uh, and the gods that characterize our sense of being. So, the name is what's important, and the characteristics of the deity is important. Within that, within the observation of what are the characteristics of the deities themselves, is what are the cosmic forces at play? Because we observe that eventually things uh, lose their peace. They are not always so stable. They're not always so peaceful. There's going to be storms. There's going to be lightning and thunder. There's going to be earthquakes. And there's going to be floods. What are they? There's going to be stars falling from the sky. What are the cosmic forces at play where we live? And therefore, what are the cataclysmic catastrophes that we can remember in our family story of where we live. What happened in the past? What were the consequences of what happened? When there was a great flood, what happened next? What were the consequences? Could those uh, catastrophes have been avoided? And And if it is indeed disastrous and destructive, well, what do we do next? How can we resolve the event of the catastrophe? How can we rebuild? How can we learn from it and uh, uh, maybe prevent it from happening again? 
when we understand the forces of where we live, the characteristics of the gods, we can then start to implement them onto ourselves. We can start to, to walk in the characteristic of the gods that we believe in. And whoever amongst us embodies those characteristics the best, they obviously become the leader of the group. They become chief. They become king. Because they embody the deity the best. And in doing so, uh, we, we come to understand who we are and who is our leader. Where did we come from? And what qualities do we need to overcome the challenges and the dangers of where we live? And all of that is embedded in the leader who leads us in this place. So therefore, we ask the question, how should we live as a society to maintain cosmic order? And that will be the responsibility of the leader. Now, this summary of these four points, the origin story, who is our God, what character, what, what catastrophes can we remember, uh, uh, who are we and who is our leader, how, do we, how does a leader emerge. These are common grounds that we can observe in all the old creation stories, essentially. We can, there's more we can observe, but these are the, essentially what is uh, observable consistently, and therefore instructing us as to the purpose of a creation story. And all that, therefore, is relevant for our creation story, not in the plural, but in the singular. Not gods and goddesses, but the living, invisible creator who is God. In the beginning, God created. Now, therefore, uh, when we apply these principles to the, uh, the biblical creation story, we start to have some uh, uh, real guidance for ourselves as to the relevance and the importance of it. And so to, uh, let's start to give some examples of, the, uh, of how we can start to apply the, 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 the principles of the purpose of a creation story to our creation story. Well, Starting in the, in the beginning is probably as far as we're going to get. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, there's various ways in which people have, have dissected this and sought to understand it. Uh, uh, good quality scholars have explained how this is indeed the first act of creation, not, uh, uh, not an end of itself, but the first initial start. I'm going to suggest, I'll, as interesting as that is, it makes more sense to me. You will have to decide for yourself that this is, um, it makes more sense to me in, the, in terms of the observation of the structure of the chapter, of chapter one of Genesis, that this is a summary statement introducing the story. What are we reading? We're reading a creation story, obviously, this, uh, uh, because that's what it says. And so we have a summary of all that's going to be found in the following uh, sections of the story. It tells us what it's about. And that it is about God, and it's about God creating the heavens and the earth, and it, about doing so in the beginning, setting for us a beginning. Remember the, the, the introduction, the importance of having a beginning point. Well, this is the beginning point. It is of, of great relevance and significance. And he created all that is, everything, the creation of the universe, or for the perspective of man, the observable universe, the cosmos, is what we are engaging with in what is being created. Now, he created far more than what we observe and see, but it's relevant for us because it's our story. It's, an our, it's our origin story. But what about what we believe in and what is not told us in this story? such as the creation of angels, the angelic hosts. There's lots of talk of angels in the Bible. When did God create them? And for that matter, uh, uh, what about Satan? What about his demons? Uh, there's a lot of things we would like to know that is simply absent. What are we not told in this origin story, this creation story? What is not told, us, told to us is also quite important. And 
when we seek to make sense of what is missing, well, people formulate all sorts of creative methods and ideas to do so, such as, for example, the, the gap theory. When trying to integrate uh, a revolu uh, uh, evolutionary theory and the, the strata of, of, uh, of, of rock that goes back uh, supposedly millions of years, when was that? If, we, if this is true, how is it possible for creation to be only in seven days when we observe much older Earth? Well, maybe it's in between. It's in the gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Well, that's an example of, of uh, what happens when we try to do to the story what it wasn't intended to do. Meaning, we, like I uh, introduced thoroughly, the atheist scientist, the faith scientist, we both are seeking to approach this foundational story for the Bible, for the civilization, through modern questions, the lens of modern science, modern uh, questions and problems, and what is interesting to us, what we are trying to understand and, 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 uh, and know. The questions we are asking of this story is not necessarily the same questions that were being asked by the ancient peoples to whom the story was written, the purpose of the story. It is a creation story. It's the origins of all that is. But, but meeting their needs, answering their questions, which are not necessarily the same as our questions. And what is not told to us here it communicates to us also what is important to them as opposed to what's important to us. So uh, the problem with gap theory, there's a lot of problems with gap theory, uh, that the... That Satan and his demons, they get cast down to earth and in the, the millennia, the millions of years that go on between verse 1 and verse 2, whereby then the earth is thrown into chaos and, and formlessness and void and God had to recreate from the beginning. Well, the, the simplest problem with the idea is that this simply isn't written in our story. There's nothing to indicate it. There is, there is no information that uh, directly in, uh, informs us. We have to read into it. We do, it's, a, it's an eisegesis instead of an exegesis. We let the story tell us, speak to us, instead of fitting our, our needs, our questions into the story. So, uh, therefore, to do so, we try to make ourselves not necessarily even Israelite. Yes, Israelite, later on. The Bible will inform us, will instruct us, guide us as to how to read and understand these verses, these chapters. The, the Bible is the authoritative commentary, God's explanation, ancient Israelite understanding of these verses. But before there was Israel, there were the other peoples, the Mesopotamian peoples, the, the peoples of Canaan, the peoples of Egypt. We try as much as possible to become one of them in hearing our story. Meaning, what would, it, what would they have heard? How would it have spoken to them? What would be the meaning that they would have perhaps uh, uh, assumed to have heard and understood? What messages would it, they uh, go away with? Well, in this first verse, and following through the rest of this chapter, one of the biggest questions, there's a lot of big questions, but one of the initial, the, maybe the first obvious question is who is this God anyway? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Which God? Marduk, uh, God of, um, God that is significant in the Babylonian uh, creation story. Uh, Atum, significant God of creation in the Egyptian story. Who is this God? Their stories all name their gods like individuals, like characters, real people. Not so with our story. That is, that is maybe one of the biggest contrast. We expect the one of the purposes of the story is to reveal God and his name. But that's not what we find. Elohim is not a name. It's a, more of a title. It's a statement. That we're dealing with deity, the divine, 
with God. But what's his name? And when we look, when we are hearing the story, it is drawing us to be more and more on the edge of our seats. Who is this God? What's his name? Oh, I like the story. It's, oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's a good story. What's his name? Wow, so ma- Wow. It's so different from the stories I've heard. It's so different from the stories I know. What's his name? And we're not told until the summary sentence that we spoke, we made mention of, we read earlier on. And that is this, the conclusion summary that also is a transition verse into the next part of the story that is going to be told starting in chapter 2 and 3. And that is Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. What I read before, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When God, when the Lord God, Hashem, there is the first time we find the name of God revealed. Essentially, what we can understand from this, at least the beginning statement of what we can understand is, like I said before, that the way in which this God wants to be known is through what he has made through the story. You observe the the creation of the heavens and the earth and you observe the natural world and you come to know him. You come to know the creator. That's the beginning of a wonderful conversation of uh, the revelation of God's name, his character, his reputation, his name. And therefore, what does he want from us? And what can we know about him from this story? That is uh, essentially what we are supposed to be gleaning. So that's a great contrast. It's a significant contrast. Uh, and uh, and it, it is here in this verse, chapter 2, verse 4, the first utterance of the personal name of God that then is going to be coupled together with his title throughout the rest of chapter 2 and chapter 3. And in a direct explanation of his name is going to be given by God to Moses at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 3. So that is of great significance, importance to observe, and then we can start to read back. Once we come to understand this and we understand that, then we can build a bigger picture as how Scripture continues to reveal more information to us. So his, uh, his personal name is not from the beginning, but it's at the climax and there in that climax is, well, then another question. We just encountered six days, seven days of creation. But then Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 states on the day in which the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And that transitions us into the next phase of the story where the perspective changes. It's not a separate story. It's a change of perspective, you might say. Instead of heavens and earth, we have earth and heavens. And instead of seven days, we have one day of creation. What's going on? Is God creating in seven days or is he creating in one day? How are we to understand a day? Is it 24-hour periods of time or are they eras of time how are we supposed to understand well on one hand the shabbat seems to indicate quite clearly to us in that we observe the celebration of the shabbat every seventh day that these are meant to be taken literally as seven days of creation seven 24 hour periods of time but just to throw a little bit of a monkey wrench a little bit of a uh, a problem into that how do we observe time? How do we calculate time? Is thanks to what God has created on the fourth day. The great lights in the sky, the, the sun, moon, stars, they're not named, but rather described the great lights. And that the other peoples, they deified, and they were the most important gods. For Egypt, the sun. For Mesopotamia, the moon. They, these are the significant gods, and therefore they must not be named because the Hebrew names for these elements are the names of the gods themselves. <clears throat> and, is, and is perhaps therefore what God is emphasizing, you don't know me. Don't assume you do. Don't view me through your theological lens. Don't view me through your spiritual uh, assessment of the world in which you live. I am not those gods. They are not describing how, what I'm like. So, therefore, it's without names. 
it has to have a clean, fresh start. He wants to reveal himself on his terms. And so it is on the fourth day that these, not gods, but lights, illuminators in the heavens above, not just for light, but also for, for days and for years, for appointed times. Essentially, on the fourth day, we have the creation of how we will observe and calculate the movement of time. That's one of the things that we observe being created. Well, if that's the case, if 24-hour periods of time is created only on the fourth day, then what kind of days were before? Were they 24-hour periods of time? What were they? And what was the character of the light that was created on day one of creation? For the first thing that God creates is light. But he doesn't create the illuminators, the illuminaries, until the fourth day. So these, this is an example of how the story is formulated purposefully in order to force us to ask the questions, to jar up our assumptions about reality, our presuppositions, our, our assumptions of what is real and what is false, what is true. He's shaking everything up. So to reveal anew a world that we didn't know, to reveal anew himself, God, whom we never knew, but always somewhat yearned to know. So those are some examples. Another Im important example is indeed uh, the earth itself. But maybe we'll come back to that a little bit later. So continuing on, we need to be clear then on those contrasts for the ancient Near Eastern audience how different this story is. Not only is the name of God not stated in the beginning, but rather the summary statement. Well, the, the generations of personified elements are deified in the other stories. Okay? Like we said, but not here in our story. There's no generations of other gods, elements deified into gods and goddesses. There's, there's none of that. And how did they create us through their sexual activity? There's none of that. There's no sexual acts of creation amongst the gods in our story. There's no cosmic conflicts between the gods through which they overcame chaos to bring forth order. There's, there's no epic battles between the gods in our story. There's, it, it is not an origin story limited to to a local geography. It's not just about Babylon. It's not just about Egypt. No, this origin story is about all mankind. Its relevance is for everybody. It's not just drawing on the ex observed experience of the world in Egypt or between the rivers of Mesopotamia, but rather it's brilliantly relevant for everyone. And... Therefore, an origin story of all peoples upon the earth. And along those lines, once creation brings forth humanity, when God creates mankind at, in the sixth day, we find that human beings are not created as they are in, the, in, the, in, in Babylon, for example, as slaves of the gods. No. They don't, uh, th this story does not speak of God, still unnamed. We don't know him. He's revealing himself to us, and part of what he, the, the beauty of, the, the, the wonder of who he is, he doesn't create us to be his slaves, but rather masters of creation. That's what we learn in chapter 1, in the sixth day, creating mankind in the image and likeness of the creator, instructed to rule the creation, who had already been created, all the other living creatures are already brought forth, already blessed by God, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Now humanity is instructed to rule them while living in the image and likeness of God. And therefore we can understand that we are to maintain their 
blessing of God upon them. We are to guard, serve the ecosystems by which all living creatures find a harmony in which they continue to multiply and fill the earth. We are servants of creation, not slaves of God or the gods. Not a slave, but a master. But not a master that exploits the creation, but rather a ruler who maintains the uh, observes understands his responsibility to the creation and and, uh, uh, and serving it for the mutual blessing of of all the mutual prosperity of all and in that responsibility therefore maintaining cosmic order and that is not merely on the shoulders of the king or the priests like in the other stories or the other societies, the civilizations, uh, uh, the, the other cradles of civilization. No, in our story, that responsibility for maintaining order is not just on the leader, but on everybody. All people are entrusted with this mandate from God to live in his likeness and to rule, I would say, serve his creation. And in doing so, maintaining cosmic order. That was the big thing about the other stories. Otherwise, catastrophes happen. Stars fall from the skies. Floods overtake us and destroy. Armies come through and devastate. Famine. What do we do? We must conduct ourselves appropriately to prevent Disaster to prevent the chaos that can destroy us, but rather uh, from chaos to strive towards order in that responsibility is on the shoulders of the king. No, that's the contrast of our story. It's the responsibility of all of us, as it's an origin story of all of us. So therefore, that those were the things that we can contrast between our story and the other stories. But what, what can we observe that we shared in common? What are the principal agreements within the cultural dialogue of the Torah account of creation with Mesopotamia and Egypt and their creation myths? That's essentially what I'm uh, uh, suggesting, that we didn't borrow from them, we didn't take from them, but rather we are in dialogue with them. And therefore we ta- we're talking about the relevant themes. And we are going to be in agreement in certain areas, such as all the stories, including ours, begin with the abysmal waters, which represent chaos. Verse 2, the earth was in tohu vavohu, and darkness was over the abyss, the tehom. And the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. That is in agreement with the other stories. They also began with waters, particularly of the seas, the salt waters and such. And the earth emerges from it. And the, the forces of chaos are either destructive or yearning for order. Now, for, for this, I'm very grateful for the instruction uh, I have gleaned from uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, very famed online uh, um, psychologist. Well, uh, th- th- that is what we can also glean from these stories, such as the Egyptians. They characterize the waters as chaos, but also as serpents. Some serpents were protective guardians of the sun god. But then there is the Apophis, serpent the the great serpent who sought to swallow up the sun god and therefore all of his creation every night and both are coming out of the same waters so chaos can either be destructive only or they can be productive they can they can move us to strive for uh, bringing forth order a circumstance in which we can live in peace but then that order has the potential of becoming too much order, and we then can fall into a tyranny of order and need, therefore, the influence of chaos to start again. That is a, a principle that we can observe in that a serpent is quite an important 
character of our biblical creation story. And, well, he succeeds in his attempt, what he attempts to do. Not only serpents, but dragons themselves are the common agents of danger in that they represent a conglomerate uh, gathering together of different creatures into one. But not just any creatures, the alpha predators, the greatest dangers, whether it is the, the big cats or the big serpents or the powerful winged creatures of the sky that can just swoop down. Well, there's a conglomerate creature. You might say, well, where do we have a dragon in the Bible? Well, in the creation of the living creatures of the sea, when talking about the great reptiles, the word translated reptile is tanin, which is the Hebrew word for dragon, elsewhere also in scripture. The, not translated as such in order to avoid a mythological reading of the biblical narrative, which is good and important, but then we miss so, uh, the uh, meeting points with the early audience that would have been significant and relevant. Identify the great dangers, and when you identify those great dangers, what characteristics will you embody in order to overcome those dangers? And once you do so, then you'll have a greater predator and a greater predator until you become the conglomerate of all predators and the alpha predator yourself and that's what humanity will become so that's how so serpents and even dragons are important and if we were to say that we surely don't have dragons in our our biblical story that's m too mythological well we do have a conglomerate mythical creature uh, adopted into our story when god places the cherubim as guardians of the way to the tree of life so it's simply to expand what we accept as uh, acceptable measures in our, in our interpretation. Uh, why it's important is because it would have been very relevant for the ancient peoples. It would have had a profound message for the ancient peoples. <coughs> Excuse me. Not only does creation begin with waters, but it also has the earth emerging from the waters. And the creation of the cosmos and the maintenance of the cosmic order is also central to the cultic worship dressed up in ritual within the sanctuaries that for the other peoples, their stories had significant roles in their sanctuaries, in their temples. So also for us in that when we observe the dwelling place of God, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, embroidered into the curtain and worked into the gold of the Ark of the Covenant are the cherubim. And the question of the, the, uh, the catastrophe that took place in our origin story is worked out and com communicated and educated in the sanctuary of God, in the dwelling place of God. Man in search of Eden that we have lost is to find Eden in the dwelling place of God. How do we get back there? We can't enter. We're not pure. We're not holy. We, our sin prevents us from entering into this place. So what is the, the story that God will teach Israel and Israel to the nations as to how will God restore not just Israel, but all mankind back into Eden. And that is communicated through the sanctuary and uh, unfolds through biblical prophecy. M come back to that in, in a few more minutes. But first, just to continue on with this uh, uh, comparison of common principle agreements between our story and the other people's stories, the, the divine characteristics of God that we are to observe and emulate, they're to be most valued, most important. What is he like? That's what we are to value. And they, those values, those characteristics, are represented in the phenomena of light. As God first, as the Spirit of God, the energy of God, is, is the breath of God is moving over the waters, he then speaks light into the waters. And he saw the light and said that it is good. And we, we can uh, break down 
from our story as well as the other stories of the other peoples, the value represented in light that is experienced as that pre-dawn light. Before the sun rises, you start to see the light chasing away the darkness from the earth. And therefore, the qualities of sight. When you have light, you can start to see what you couldn't see in the dark, obviously. So therefore, the value characteristic of being able to see but the question is, is how do you see? Is it good sight? Is it correct? Is it useful? Do you see like God sees? Well, he sees his creation and he assesses, he observes and, and, and uh, gives the assessment. So therefore is perception. Not just sight, but perception. And with perception is wisdom and insight. And that's communicated in logical speech that effectively communicates and that therefore is powerful that with our capacity to speak we can be utterly destructive or we can illuminate we can speak like god or otherwise and when we speak like god we are illuminating truth and truth is upon upon truth we find justice working its magic bringing forth peace and order Without truth, there is no freedom. Liberty is, is protected and made manifest on truth for the sake of the peoples in the society. And that is communicated in our speech. We are to speak truthful words, speak truly. From the, 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 the insight and the wisdom that we have gleaned through our perception in our ability to see and observe. These are the characteristics of the divine. These are the characteristics of God that are demonstrated in the story. There's so much more, but these are not only characteristics that God in the Torah wants to teach us that are important, they're also what we can observe. In the Egyptian stories, for example, also in Babylon, but particularly evident in the Egyptian stories, that is also heralded by them to be fundamental values of great importance and to the point that they are deified. The difference is the Torah is not calling sight a God. It's not calling perception a God or speech a God, truth a God. No, he is saying that these are qualities of the creator and that's where we differ from the other stories. That's where in this dialogue, the other peoples have an opportunity to step away from towards the revelation of the Torah. Uh, in that, if these are the characteristics of the Creator in whose likeness we have been created, then these are our characteristics. These are describing the likeness of human character when we live godlike in a godly manner. Uh, there's so much more in this story but hopefully this is already uh, enough to demonstrate the importance of having a, a useful hermeneutic principle that, when followed, becomes relevant and accessible not only to the faith community, not only for the faith scientists, but even the atheist scientific community can glean from and benefit from does not have to have a problem with our story we can at the same time believe as we do that this is also describing the origins of the universe they can disagree with us but they can appreciate the, the intrinsic value of our foundational story and not reject it when uh, when it is in, in uh disagreement from how they perceive the world. So, therefore, that is a, a significant first step m towards our counterparts in our civilization. That is now a global phenomenon. That we will th we'll have a tool, a means by which we can draw near to one another in dialogue, in understanding, in strengthening. Because as we are, we are getting weaker and weaker with the loss of, of, of God, a loss of truth, a loss of morality, we lose the means by which we protect ourselves from the dangers outside our society, uh, which are the conflicts that I made mention of in the beginning. Uh, 
that we are indeed in serious uh, danger of losing all that we have uh, achieved and all that we have uh, benefited from. We can lose it all, but we don't need to. If we come back to a, a good hermeneutic of our creation story, hopefully demonstrated in, in, in just a, even just an uh, initial demonstration, that the values of the characteristic of God can transform how we function in, in our society. Last example before I, I close, in that the focus of chapter 2 comes into the creation, not just of man, but of woman, and how humanity in chapter 1 is created as male and female together, equally, we make, fan- we make manifest the likeness of God. But then we go into the detail of how God creates not just man and woman, but the marriage relationship. How do you take two into one life? We learn how marriage becomes, and therefore how family becomes foundational for the kingdom of God as the society of God in the lives of man. Civilizational foundation, family, is of intrinsic importance. And uh, how do we establish strong family ties? How do we establish or nurture healthy family relations? And what are the the dangers that uh, can infiltrate uh, to disrupt family relations uh, that, uh, that can break and tear us apart? and weaken the foundation of our civilization. That's chapter 2 and chapter 3. All right. Let's conclude here for time's sake.